Hello and welcome to your instructional cichlid aquarium guide. I'm Paul Talbot. I'm going to teach you the do's and don'ts of African cichlids and how to set up the aquariums relevant for them. I find that the more people learn about these fish, the more passion they tend to have about them. But a lot of people just don't get the time to read books and do the necessary research to learn about these fish, to cultivate this passion. So I've produced this program to make it easier for you. Cichlids really are one of the most versatile type of fish because not only can they be a really good hobby, a great pet, but they can also be viewed as a piece of furniture because they're just so low maintenance. Unlike many other fish which need the water to be neutral, therefore they don't want it too acid, they don't want it too alkaline, they want it in the middle which is a neutral pH. These ones like the water alkaline which can be easily maintained there because you can put the various decorations in the water that will keep the water alkaline and most tap water tends to be alkaline anyway. So that just reduces the amount of testing that needs to be done for these fish. A lot of the time cichlids are chosen as an easier alternative to the saltwater fish. Now not only do some of the cichlids have colour which will rival the saltwater fish with bright yellows, bright blues, bright oranges, but they're just so easy to look after. So what a lot of people will do, even get dead corals and create an environment which looks very much like a saltwater aquarium, if you want that very marine look with gorgeous colours, but you don't want the effort to look after them. Now I'm going to walk you through all the steps for setting up the aquarium. Everything from filtration, lighting, heating, water parameters, information on breeding these fish. So if you start off with some of the easiest cichlids to breed, you'll find that you can breed them and grow the young up quite easily, and then you can sell those babies off to the stores. Now they'll usually want to swap them for a credit, if you swap them for cash you don't typically get as much for them but if you swap them for a credit then you can upgrade the types of fish that you're keeping and broaden your experience with these fish. No matter what size or style of house you've got you always have room for an aquarium particularly if you're inventive enough. During the course of this video you'll see some very interesting aquariums both set in walls and made of parts of other pieces of furniture. Providing that you're creative, you'll be surprised what ideas you too can come up with. It's really worth researching the types of fish that you're going to put into your aquarium because there will be something that suits you. Now if you only have a very small aquarium, there is some really interesting little shell dwelling cichlids and other things which are relevant for a small aquarium. On the other hand, if you have a small aquarium, don't go getting your sorts of species that grow very large, which are going to be of course inappropriate for that tank. So make sure you do the research, it's a lot of fun to learn about these fish anyway, to find what is most appropriate for the circumstance that you're offering. One of the things that I love about the cichlids is just purely how intelligent these animals are. Now you might say, pfft, what's a smart fish? But when you sit and watch these fish, you will really learn that these are an intelligent animal. These are not like a little tetra that sort of work on instinct. These are a fish that think. These are a fish that seem to understand the structures of what's going on with their little lives. You'll see that this one's best friends with that one. This one's got a house. No one else is allowed in his house. They'll know which ones are a threat to them and how to react towards them. In general, these fish don't always respond the way that you want them to respond or the way that they're supposed to respond because each individual fish is a highly intelligent little animal which responds its own way as its own character. Now you can have one little individual from one particular batch of fish that's very aggressive, very antisocial. You can have another little individual which came a brother and sister from the same batch of fish which will be very peaceful and not cause you any trouble at all. Most of these fish have followed very unique evolutionary paths which have some very interesting stories about their characteristics. Many people find that the most confusing thing about cichlids is the names of the cichlids. People get very frustrated that not all the cichlids have common names like electric yellow. People will say to me, why don't they just call them electric yellows? Why do they have to call them Labidochromus coruleus? Now the reason why we need to call these fish by their proper names is so that we can minimize crossbreeding. Now 
in any one country, we've got limited strains of these species of fish. And it's very important that we endeavour to keep these fish pure. So therefore, we need to know what this fish is in order to breed it with another one of this fish. Now, the scientific names might seem a little bit scary when they first start out, but then once you learn the name, for example, Melanochromus interruptus, it sounds very big and impressive when you first learn the name. Once you actually learn it, Melanochromus interruptus, it sounds very impressive when you tell your friends. So what I find is that someone that knows the right name, knows about the fish, just seems to have a boundless energy towards these fish and an unbelievable passion. A phenomenon that's hitting us now is the hormone food. There's many brands which are promoted to be some miracle cure with the colours of your fish. You will buy this food, it will colour your fish full colour at that size, when in the wild they may not colour till they're that big. A lot of these foods are hormone induced. Do not have anything to do with hormone induced foods. It not only changes all of the fish to male, but you'll get a lot of health problems within a relatively short period of time. This has the potential of wrecking our hobby, because if everyone breeds sets of fish, they put them all out in the marketplace, full of hormone foods, unbelievable colour, all genetically messed up, it's not going to be long before those fish frazzle out of the hobby, because there's not enough healthy, good, strong, solid females to maintain the purity of these strains. I trust that you will really enjoy this guide I've put together, and I hope that it arms you with the information that you need so you too can be a very successful cichlid hobbyist. Use the chapters of this video as a guide and try and understand the concepts behind the various chapters in the video, and you'll find that'll go a long way towards you understanding really how to keep a beautiful, large cichlid aquarium like this one behind me. Many people dream about having an aquarium in a wall. In this case, it's in a bar, which is a very safe and practical idea. It minimises the public's access to the top of the aquarium, making it therefore safer, and looks really good as a feature of the bar. Though cichlids are a very easy fish to keep, the most complicated issue that you're definitely going to have to deal with is the mixing of the cichlid, both with themselves and other types of fish. Because a cichlid is a highly intelligent fish, you never know exactly how they're going to react when introduced to another tank mate. One of the easiest things to remember is that the younger the fish, the more compatible it tends to be with its tank mates. If you get a whole bunch of small cichlids and introduce them together, the chances of them getting along and growing up together is quite significant. On the other hand, as the fish get older and get used to their ways and used to the fish they've grown up with, they tend to be less compatible with other tank mates. The safest bet is to have an aquarium pretty much full of cichlids, though other people like to wean other types of fish in with the cichlid for diversity amongst the aquarium. This is very much a hit or miss tactic. In some circumstances, various fish work, and in other circumstances, those same fish just don't work. Because the cichlid is a very intelligent species, each individual cichlid will react to other fish in somewhat unpredictable manners. For example, fish like silver sharks, mono angels, clown loaches, scats, various sucker fish will work in one aquarium and simply not work in the other aquarium. It's really a matter of trying your aquarium and seeing how your cichlids react to that style of fish. In general, the larger the cichlid, the less compatible it is with other tank mates. If you have a, for example, large mabuna or large type of African cichlid and try and introduce it with other fish, there's a much lower chance of that fish getting along because it's grown up and become accustomed to its territories, its tank mates, and is generally less able to adapt to a new environment and is more likely to be irritable and aggressive than a smaller one, not unlike humans. One of the first comments that people realise about the African cichlid is that many of them look quite plain and boring when they're young. 
Now this tempts many people to try introducing adults to their aquarium. In general it's better to be patient and put the juveniles in, let the juveniles grow up and get used to the aquarium as it establishes. On the other hand, the larger adults tend to be far more colourful than the babies, even to the extreme where some of the babies will be brown or silver, which will grow into beautiful blues, reds and other beautiful colours that the cichlids will contain. What I would suggest doing if you're a beginner is to keep a list of the fish that you keep. Therefore, when you go to consult your aquarium expert at your local aquarium shop, you can bring the list with you, allowing them to advise you what sort of fish are likely to work with your aquarium. The first thing to consider is how aggressive the fish are. Obviously, if you put a fish into your aquarium that's more aggressive than the fish you've got, it potentially could kill some of the fish in your aquarium. As well as that, if it's not aggressive as your fish, then it may get killed by the fish in your aquarium. When you're introducing the fish, this really needs to be considered. Also, the pH of the aquarium. You don't want to keep a, an acid-type aquarium and go putting in a fish that prefers alkaline pH, otherwise the chances of it getting sick is, of course, very high. Also, consider the amount of salt that they advise that you put into the water and the types of food that you should be feeding them. Understand what it is that you feed your current aquarium and make sure that it's acceptable diet for the new fish that you introduce. Most fish are opportunists, so any large fish will more than likely eat small fish. So there's a, I guess, size of mouth rule where even if it's a large peaceful fish, even a goldfish, if it's got a mouth large enough to eat your small fish, you can almost guarantee it's probably going to end up there. So with this combination of fish, while they're small, they all will tend to get along. On the other hand, as they grow up, and personalities develop, you can have one aquarium with this same mix of fish and all the fish can seem to get along with no problems whatsoever for years. On the other hand, you can have another aquarium which has basically the opposite result where some of the individuals become quite aggressive and may attack some of the other species. It's really important to monitor and watch this as it's occurring. Now, generally it'll be one instigator that will cause most of the aggression and problems in your aquarium because the key is the dominant fish. If you've got a dominant fish in the aquarium which is acting slightly aggressively between most of the fish and exerting its dominance and interrupting or breaking any fights that break out between the fish, then you'll find that the fish will grow up well. On the other hand, if you've got a less observant or let's say not as good boss, then in general there can be a lot more problems with aggression because that boss will usually be overridden and a lot of aggression can occur in the aquarium. Every aquarium will have a hierarchy. There'll be the boss, then the second boss, then all the way down to the biggest wimp. Now the boss's job should be to control the rest of the fish. If this is working properly, then the hierarchy of the aquarium should not change. On the other hand, if the boss is not controlling the rest of the ranks and hierarchy is changing, you will result in a lot of aggression being in the aquarium. So how aggressive the aquarium is, is governed by how many fish are in the aquarium, what type of fish are in the aquarium, and who the boss of the aquarium is. So in this aquarium, I'd be watching the silver sharks and the loaches as being the more peaceful fish that may get picked on. On the other hand, I'd be looking at things like the red scats and the mono angels as potentially being the more aggressive ones. The colour and effect can look strongest if you pick a few types of fish that you like, particularly if you like the electric yellows. Get quite a high number of the electric yellow because when they're all together, that unity is really quite striking and that high presence of yellow will look quite powerful in the aquarium. In this chapter, what I'm going to do is walk you through how to set up a cichlid aquarium. Now the first thing you want to do is select yourself an aquarium as big as possible. Now so many times people will buy an aquarium from the store and it either wasn't quite what they were after or it doesn't look quite as big once it settles in into the home. So make sure you buy the tank as big as possible. Also try to have your filtration as big as possible because in general larger filters are more versatile and they can handle a larger bio load, which is the amount of stock in the aquarium. Now when buying the aquarium, try and make the aquarium as long and as wide as possible to increase the surface area of the water. Try not to purchase tall, thin aquariums with small surface area because the amount of surface area the aquarium will have 
directly relates to the amount of fish you can have in the aquarium. So large filters and large aquariums generally reach a lot less regret. Though the standard models of aquarium sizes and colours tend to be cheaper, don't forget that an aquarium is a long-term investment. So don't be afraid to get a custom aquarium. Though they're a little bit more expensive, it's really important to get something that suits your home style and purpose. Now watch as I show you step by step how to set up varying different types of cichlid aquariums utilising different types of filtration and different size tanks. I'm going to start with this custom 5 foot African cichlid tank which is going to be run with a majestic filter. Make sure you put a lot of thought into the positioning of your aquarium. You want to try and keep it away from any major thoroughfares like hallways are not the best idea, away from slamming doors and definitely direct sunlight. Try to keep the aquarium away from direct sunlight because that's going to encourage algae problems and possibly temperature problems. A corner like this is absolutely perfect. Make sure under any aquarium that you always have polystyrofoam. Now what this does is take up any irregularities in your stand. No matter how flat you think your stand is, make sure you have the polystyrofoam. Now this filter is run off an overflow principle. So what happens is you've got the filter down the bottom, it blows water up via a pump into the top of the aquarium, which overflows the aquarium via a hole, which returns the water down into the filter again. Now there's various different ways to take the water from the aquarium down into the sump. There are overflow chambers that people make in the corner of the aquarium. I think that the least obvious is just simply a hole in the back of the aquarium. You, if you want the water level relatively low, you'll put the hole down lower, remembering that if you're pumping a lot of water up, you'll need to make sure that this hole is low enough to accept the amount of water which is outputted by the pump. It really is important to have good filtration on your aquarium and understand how this filtration works. There's heaps of different filtration available. Everything from internal box filters, under gravel filters, internal canister filters, hang on filters, external canister filters, trickle filters, and other types of sump filters. A lot of them are very effective. The most important thing is to have filters which are big enough for the capacity that you need and to make sure that you understand how to use them properly. You've got to make sure you get a really reliable brand of heater and before you put the heater into the aquarium set it on 25 degrees and remember that the heater is a thermostat it is not a thermometer. You must have a separate thermometer which is away from the heater to determine the actual temperature of the heater. Most of these heaters can be safely submerged, but it's best to have just the end of it out of the water. It's really important that you're happy with the position of the aquarium, because now we're gonna fill it with gravel, decorations and water, and there's no way you'll be able to move it once it's completed. So now it's time to fill up the tank. You'll be surprised how long it takes to fill up a big aquarium like this one. There's all different types of aquarium tubes on the market. There's Biolux tubes, which really enhance the color of the fish. There's high intensity full spectrum tubes, which really illuminate the whole aquarium. 
There's actinic tubes that give the blue effect. Now, as far as the cichlids are concerned, they're not worried which lighting you choose. It's really just your preference. So it's worth looking at the different types of tubes available and experiment, particularly on your aquarium, and see which ones you like the look of and which ones bring up the colour of your fish. If your aquarium is about 18 inches high, you will typically use a single fluorescent row over the aquarium. If the aquarium is up to two foot high, you would generally use a minimum of two rows over the top of the aquarium. It's not at all important how much light you use or what light you use with the cichlids. It's really just to create the effect that you're after. Okay, now you've got your hood on your aquarium and you've finished your initial setup. You've got plenty of aeration, your filtration's going, you've got your heaters on and you're waiting for them to get up to 25 degrees on your thermometer. Next is to check the pH and make sure the pH is adequate for your fish. Things like African cichlids like the pH alkaline and we've got a little bit of coral sand through the bottom which will make the pH alkaline. Most tap waters tend to be alkaline as well and these white rocks make the water alkaline. We tend to encourage at least a double dose of water ager to make sure there's no chlorine in the water. So your temperature's right, your pH is right, we've added plenty of water ager. Also a lot of fish like cichlids like a little bit of salt in the water. Tend to use about one teaspoon per five litres and there's plenty of good brands available. Follow the recommendations, add some salt, then you're ready to get your fish. It's really important you've got a good set of glass lids over the top of your aquarium because even through the tiniest gaps, it's always your favourite fish that jumps out. Now when positioning rocks in your aquarium, what you're aiming to do is to try and minimise how much of the rock touches the gravel. So if you've got a large rock and it takes up that much room, all the detritus will build up around the outside and underneath the rock. Whereas what you want to aim to do is to try and put the rock on points so then there's a much smaller area touching the gravel. So you can use the glass or you can use other rocks to anchor each other off to try and elevate the rock as much as possible. Now, I typically will pick up a rock, place it in the water, roll it around in my hand and look for the most interesting feature of the rock and try to make sure that the most interesting feature is getting used best at its advantage. So you're trying to make as many caves, you're trying to create as much elevation, as many little holes where the fish can swim in and through. Try not to create contact with the surface as much as possible and you should be able to decorate your aquarium beautifully. When selecting the gravel for your aquarium you've got many choices. Things like the coral sand is only appropriate for fish that are going to have a very high pH like the African cichlids. On the other hand a one to three mil Normal pebble crete is generally what I'll recommend. There's brownish, reddish, blacks, whites. I do find that if you've got a pale coloured substrate, the colour of the fish will tend to be more pale as well. On a slightly darker substrate, the fish will bring out a more predominant pigment, stronger colour. I'll also find that if the substrate is too dark, that will promote the fish to become quite dark as well. So I'll generally like a reddy, brown type natural looking pebble creek. Generally one to three millimetre is perfect for the rocks. If you have rocks that are five millimetres or above, you find that it harbours too much detritus. And what happens then is the detritus falls into the gravel as opposed to landing on the gravel. If the gravel is fine, as in three millimetres or one millimetre gravel, the detritus will land on it, where the fish can sift through it and pull any excess nutrients out of it. In this particular case, you can see that the sand is really dirty underneath. You can see that the fish are sort of tossing it around at the top, but you've got a lot of gunk filling up underneath. It would be really advisable to do a gravel clean on this gravel a bit more regularly to make sure that you don't get bad types of bacteria, anaerobic bacteria forming underneath this gravel. On all circumstances, I recommend that you keep your gravel as thin as possible because when it does start getting thick like this, the amount of gunk that's building up in it does lower your water quality and does encourage the growth of anaerobic bacteria, which discharge hydrogen sulfide, which is a toxic acid into the aquarium and is actually capable of killing your fish.
The only time you'd have a thick bed of gravel is if you wanted to grow plants because they'll need that for their roots. So when you do a gravel clean, don't clean around the very base of the plant, otherwise you're going to damage the roots of the plant. In a cichlid aquarium, keep your gravel as thin as possible because cichlids don't really work with plants anyway because the pH is too high. So therefore, a thin bed of gravel is very important. In cases such as this one, which has got coral sand in it, monitor the fish carefully because it's not uncommon for the coral sand to be quite sharp and damage the gill lining of the fish. In the natural environment, these cichlids would either be over a purely rocky environment, which may have a thin layer of mulm over the rock. Mulm is a very soft, non-organic detritus, which doesn't damage the gill of the fish at all. It's very soft on the fish. On the other hand, things like your coral sand is very sharp on the fish. And if you see the fish very much irritated and they're scratching at their gills, the coral sand may easily be the reason. This aquarium is really effectively decorated using predominantly driftwood and artificial plants. Artificial plants for a cichlid aquarium is definitely the choice, especially with the fish which is in this aquarium, which are silver dollars, severums, and other fish which really enjoy eating plants. Not only will most of the fish in this aquarium devour live plants, but they will also rip them up and uproot them all the time. So it's a lot less frustrating if you use artificial plants and make sure you anchor the artificial plants down what most people will do is silicon pebbles to the base of the artificial plant to make sure that it stays anchored because there's nothing worse than having artificial plants which keep floating up to the surface all the time because it's very predictable that these fish are going to uproot them. Now if you're going to use driftwood in the aquarium it's an excellent choice especially with the more acidic water fish such as the American cichlids. It is less common to find driftwood in the African cichlid aquariums because it does tend to release tannic acids which drops the pH a little bit, which is undesirable to the African cichlids. And you'll find the way the color shows up in the fish with the slightly tannic water from the driftwood is a lot more desirable looking with American cichlids and really looks off with the African cichlids and quite out of place. Now, the driftwood will release tannic acids and tannins into the water, which will create a tea color look. Now, if you want to reduce the tea color, not only water changes, but predominantly the use of activated carbon will suck the tannins out of the water and make the water clear. So once again, if you are going to use driftwood in your aquarium, with American cichlids, it creates a very desirable result, can be used with African cichlids. Watch the pH and definitely run carbon. Now let's talk about temperature and lighting within an aquarium because there's different positions in your home that you can put the aquarium which will experience different conditions of temperature and lighting. So don't be afraid to experiment with the different types of tubes that are available on the market to put over your aquarium because each circumstance is different and will portray different colours within your aquarium and your fish. Now as far as lighting duration is concerned with a cichlid aquarium, in general, you don't have a lot of plants in a cichlid tank, so therefore try to have the lights on mainly only when you're viewing it. So if there's no one home, you tend to have the lights in the aquarium off. It doesn't harm or worry the fish at all. Try to reduce the amount of direct light to the tank. So if there's a window that's beaming the light straight into the tank, try and make sure that the window is closed, particularly when you're not home. So if you do have plants in the aquarium, 
you probably want a minimum of eight hours light, a maximum of 12 hours light. If there's no plants in the aquarium, like a typical cichlid aquarium, we want to have the lights on mainly while you're viewing them. Now there's plenty of commercially available heaters which are quite effective. All you need to do is set the heater before you put it into the aquarium and have a thermometer to check that the thermostat in the heater is running correctly. You'll generally run your aquarium at around 25 degrees, but if you do want to promote breeding or grow the fish a little bit fast, get the temperature up to 27 or 28 degrees. But in general, we recommend you keep the cichlids at about 25 degrees. So the temperature being too cold really shouldn't be an issue, providing that you have a good quality heater that's generously sized for the aquarium, then your only concern is that the aquarium doesn't get too hot. Make sure that you don't position the aquarium in too hot or stuffier conditions. If the temperature of the aquarium does go above 30 degrees, you may even need to get a fan and blow it across the surface of the aquarium just to cool the water, because above 30 degrees can be fatal for some fish. Now that you've got the aquarium ready, you've got your filtration and your aeration running, you've got your temperature and your pH right, it's time for the fun bit, which is to get the fish. The fish will typically come from the aquarium in a bag like this one. Make sure that there's plenty of air for the amount of water in the bag, because they don't run out of water, but they do run out of air. If you're going to be traveling for more than a couple of hours, it's good to insist that they put some oxygen in with the air in the bag, and that'll give you up to a couple of days. Once you get your fish home, you're going to have to acclimatize them, which is to adjust the temperature in the bag to the temperature in the aquarium. So float the unopened bag in the top of the aquarium for about 15 minutes. If your aquarium is well established and you've got some very dominant fish in the aquarium, which act very aggressively towards new introductions, it's a really good idea to totally rearrange your rocks. This will break up all the current territories in the aquarium, confuse and disorientate the fish that are currently in there, and they'll spend more time trying to find themselves a new territory that they want to rule, as opposed to targeting the new fish that have come into the aquarium and focusing on them and venting their aggression on them. This will disperse the aggression amongst all the other fish in the aquarium. Now that the bag's been floating for about 15 minutes, you open the bag up and roll it open. It's really important that you don't just fold the bag over the top of the aquarium. Many people lose fish doing this because the fish will be gasping and stressed at this stage and will be using a lot of oxygen, which won't be able to be replenished within the water because you've choked it off like that. The correct method is to roll the top of the bag open, trying to maximise the amount of surface area in the bag in which the gas can exchange. It's a good idea to test the water in the bag that your fish are coming from. If you're getting your fish from a reputable dealer, the pH should be fairly similar to that of your aquarium because you should be keeping your aquarium at the same pH that your fish require. So that really shouldn't be a problem. On the other hand, if the fish have been in transport for a long period of time, the pH in the bag can actually fall. So if the pH of the bag is different to the pH of your aquarium, you need to adjust the pH of the bag slowly. So, simply get a glass of water, pour it into the bag with the fish, and leave that for a further five minutes. Check the pH again. If it is then fairly similar, the fish can then be released into the aquarium. If it is still far off, repeat the process again until you get the pH roughly right. Particularly if you've got a new aquarium that doesn't have any fish in it, it's a good idea to make sure the first ones you put in are cheap, and small because they really are the test guinea pigs. And if anything's gonna go wrong, it's likely to go wrong to them. When you put your first set of fish into the aquarium, it's a good idea not to feed your aquarium for one or two days after the fish have been introduced because the aquarium doesn't have the adequate 
amounts of bacteria to break down the waste from the fish. It's a really good idea when you first get your fish to add some of the bacteria products which are available because the bacteria has to be established in your aquarium to keep the fish alive. So the fish produce the waste, the bacteria breaks down the waste. If you put the fish in first and wait for the bacteria to grow, there is a toxic period while you're waiting for that bacteria to establish. Now there are some very effective products on the market which will actually give you the bacteria so you don't have that toxic period while you're waiting for the bacteria to establish to accommodate the amount of waste produced by your fish. The most common behaviour for new fish when you put them into the aquarium is to group together and generally hide amongst the rocks. As they establish themselves in the aquarium what they'll be trying to do is secure territories in the aquarium in which they create little homes out of. So don't try and sort of chase them out of the rocks or expect them to come out within the first couple of days or weeks. You will find as you introduce more fish into the aquarium, they become braver and will venture out more and will further associate you with food. So therefore when they see you, they'll actually run to the front of the aquarium with time. Now the key to feeding cichlids is definitely variety. Try and offer your cichlids a very good variety of various pellets, flakes and frozen foods. Now the high in protein foods do make the fish grow very quickly but it does tend to increase their aggression. Now because they are a very aggressive fish anyway, the last thing you want is something that's really going to spark the aggression in them and makes them turn on each other more regularly. So if we feed all purpose foods and veggie based foods, we're in better stead than feeding the high protein ones. The fish tend to grow quickly anyway, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. I definitely no mammalin products. Um, a lot of the old books will tell you to feed a lot of your fish beef heart and all those sorts of things. It's been proven that the amount of fats in them and that are just not good for the fish at all and, and do tend to increase cases of hexamida, which is hole in the head disease, and there's other health problems that the mammalin products can actually cause. So that's your hearts and, and any meats from any terrestrial animals. In saying that, I also don't really recommend any terrestrial plants. Though the fish do actually eat it, it's been proven that the fish can't really break it down properly. High quality fish foods is really the key. So high quality flakes, high quality pellets, and brine shrimp and other good frozen foods is really the way to go for selections of food. Now the amounts of foods is the next thing. The 30 second rule is a good guide. Feed your fish, you put a little bit of food into the aquarium, um, generally submersed under the water. You look at how long it takes your fish to eat the very last speck of food and providing that's within 30 seconds, you're pretty much in good stead. You usually feed your fish five or six times a week. Generally better to feed them in the morning because they use most of their energy during the day. So you pretty much go to feed them every day and if you forget once or twice a week then that's fine. If you see your fish are getting a little bit of a belly, then definitely reduce the amount of food that's going into your aquarium. If you see that they're getting thin, then you definitely want to increase the amount of food that's going in the aquarium. And you really want to take that by the average fish. You'll always have one that's a little bit fat, you'll have one that's a little bit thin. This tank behind me, most of the condition of these fish are very good. Um, they're all quite streamlined, they're not overly fat and they're definitely not thin.
depending on the type of filter you have, it's really important that you replace your mechanical filtration medium regularly. The way that this works is you use a filter wool. The filter wool traps detritus out of the water um, and the water is circled past this detritus several times an hour. So how regularly this filter is cleaned will determine how effective it is. If this um, filter medium is exported out of the aquarium and the detritus removes quickly, the general water quality of the aquarium will remain higher. On the other hand, if you leave your filter in there and it's disgustingly dirty and the water is circled past it several times an hour, it can actually decrease the water quality. Oh well this one's definitely too dirty. It's really important that as soon as the filter wool starts to go even a light brown, you really want to throw it away because that means it's trapped as detritus. So therefore, the quicker you get that detritus out of the aquarium, the better water quality you'll have. In this case, you can really see the amount of gunk that this filter has caught and you can see the nice clean water getting circled past that gunk, which has by no means any beneficial effects on the aquarium itself. So cleaning the filter way before it gets to this stage is really important. What you'll need to clean your filter is a bucket so you don't make a mess and some replacement filter wool. The way that you clean out this particular filter is to simply peel off the filter wool, throw it into a bucket, get some replacement filter wool and return it back to the filter. In this case you just slide the filter wool underneath the spray bar so the water seeps down through the filter material before it goes into the biological material before it falls back into the aquarium. So with a model such as this one, which is very easy to clean, you just lift up the top, pull the sponge out, clean the sponge and return the sponge back to the top of the filter. Check that the biological medium is not clogged up with detritus. If it is, wash it in tank water and return the sponge back to the top of the filter again clean. So what you're trying to do is pass the water past the biological medium so the biological medium can be growing bacteria and pass the water via a mechanical filter which can take any detritus out of the water. How effective the biological filter is, is governed by how much capacity there is for biological filtration and what the medium you use for your biological filtration. So some mediums can't house much bacteria, other mediums house a lot of bacteria. So the more capacity you've got to grow bacteria, the more waste the filter can break down and make sure that not too much detritus clogs up the filter which will reduce its efficiency. Pre-filter or mechanical filter, how effective that is, is how regularly it's cleaned. With the larger canister style type filters, the amount of pre-filtration you've got is more, so therefore doesn't need to be cleaned as regularly, but in principle, the more often a pre-filter is cleaned, the more effective it is. It's really important that you don't clean your biological medium with tap water because tap water contains chlorine and chlorine kills the bacteria in the media. And if there's no bacteria in the media, there's nothing to break down the fish's waste, which becomes toxic and will often kill the fish. Now the way that you do clean out your biological medium is you put it in a bucket, you siphon some water out of the aquarium into the bucket, you swish it around, you don't have to get it really clean, you just have to free up any detritus that's in the media which might cause it to clog, then you simply put your media back into the filter again once it's clean. Now this is a really common situation, what's happened here is this filter's been running for quite a period of time, this is a hang on the back model filter and what's happened is they've noticed that the filter is looking quite dirty because it hasn't been cleaned for a while so the sponge was then thrown out. Now the sponge is what was keeping the aquarium pretty much alive and keeping the tank clear with the bacteria that was growing on the sponge. Now when the sponge was removed out under the impression that the sponge was too dirty the bacteria which the tank was relying on was also removed. This aquarium also doesn't have much oxygen in it now that's a problem because the bacteria in the filter will be competing with the fish for the limited supplies of oxygen that's in the water. That will mean that the bacteria will be produced more slowly and will generally be less effective. If you go for a while and your sponge gets quite dirty, it's important to clean the sponge quite well in water from the fish tank, then put the sponge back in again and maybe clean it quite regularly for a period of time until you get the quality of the sponge back up again or if you are going to replace the sponge, 
add the sponge to the old sponge until there's enough bacteria on the new sponge to then remove the old sponge. So in this case, we're going to add some matrix as the main biological filter material. We're gonna be using the sponge as a mechanical filter as it was intended. Now I'm just going to explain all about water quality for you. Besides temperature, the main thing a cichlid hobbyist needs to be concerned about is pH. Now this is not a big issue, basically what we need to know is what pH does your fish like and make sure that the pH of the fish which you're purchasing to go into your aquarium like a similar pH to the fish that you've got. With time, your aquarium tends to go acidic because the respiration from the fish and bacteria and waste produced by the fish will make the water acidic. Now typically, most town tap water tends to be alkaline, so watch when you're doing your water changes that you don't shock the pH of your fish. There's many commercially available buffers on the market which will help you maintain a high pH or a steady pH, and the introduction of any corals, shells, coral sand, shell grit, anything calcium carbonate based will help to make sure that you do maintain a nice high pH. It's really important when you're altering any water quality, particularly pH, that you do it very gradually because the fish become accustomed to the pH that you're in at the moment and you must adjust it slowly. That accounts a lot of the time for why you have what seems to be a healthy aquarium at home. You buy a fish from the aquarium, you take it home and then that fish dies. Often it's that the water quality in your home aquarium wasn't quite right the water quality at the shop hopefully was, then it's that individual has been shocked once it's been put into your aquarium. So it's not so much the water quality itself, it's more so the shock that's provided if you change your pH too quickly. So any buffers, any water changes, anything you're doing to alter pH, do it slowly and gradually over time for the safest results. Now essentially all the waste that goes into your aquarium comes from the fish food that you feed. So if you feed too much food in your aquarium, that is the only way that you're basically gonna to have too much waste in the aquarium. So you feed the food, which is proteins, amino acids and things, the fish will hopefully consume most of the food and will produce waste in the form of ammonia. Now the ammonia is released into the water or as a gas and little bacteria grow in the filter, on the glass, on the rocks, on the gravel, on any hard surface and this little bacteria called nitrosomnius bacteria will break the ammonia down into nitrite. Then nitrite is still quite toxic to the fish, ammonia being very toxic to the fish, which is the waste from the fish, then gets broken down by nitrobacter into nitrate. So you've got ammonia getting broken down into nitrite, which gets broken down into nitrate. Ammonia and nitrite are the higher level wastes, which are very toxic to your fish, nitrate is not as toxic to the fish. Water changes and the presence of denitrification will help to get rid of nitrate and having larger filters with more bacterial capacity is what gets rid of your ammonia and nitrite. The only time that you really need to be concerned about any of these organics in an aquarium is when you're putting in your fish too quickly. So the best advice I can give you is get small amounts of fish added on a regular basis with not too many going in at once to make sure that the amount of bacteria will be stable for the amount of waste being produced by your fish. The way that you get your water quality and clarity as crystal clear as this one is by making sure you've got plenty of filtration on your aquarium. Always overestimate on filtration. Make sure you always wash your filter material in water from the fish tank, not water from the tap, and don't overfeed. So if your water is a little bit cloudy, one thing to try is adding some of the bacterial agents which are available on the market, which increase the amount of bacteria in the aquarium, 
which will break down any organics and help to clear the aquarium. If that isn't working, you could also try putting in some activated carbon. Don't put the bacterial agents and the activated carbon in at the same time because the carbon will suck out the bacterial agents. But in general, carbon will clear the aquarium and take any odours out of the aquarium. Make sure you remove your carbon after about one month. One of the great things about a cichlid tank is algae is rarely a problem. Now there's various catfish and various cichlids that actually eat algae. So algae is in itself a food source. So providing you've got a good range of catfish and various algae eating fish, algae really shouldn't be a problem in a cichlid aquarium. So the key to having a crystal clear aquarium like this one is having plenty of filtration, plenty of aeration. Don't clean out your filter material with tap water. Clean it with water from the fish tank and don't overfeed your fish or have your lights on for too long a period of time. One of the keys to having a good, healthy tank full of fish is to start with good, healthy fish. When you decide on the type of fish you want to keep, have a good understanding of what this fish should look like. Look to make sure that its eyes are nice and clean and clear, that you don't have any sort of white bacterial hazes over the eyes, which is generally a negative sign to water quality or the general health of the fish. Make sure the scales are well in line and in good condition. Make sure the fins are of appropriate length that are not all split. The eye of the fish should be in proportion to the rest of the body, meaning that if you look at various fish within the aquarium, how big the eye of the fish is relative to ones amongst that species will tell whether the fish has been stunted. If a fish has been stunted, it'll be quite a small fish. It'll have what seems to be a proportionately large eye. What you're really looking for is the proportion of the eye whether the eye is swollen by any means, which could indicate like a bacterial infection, or the haze over the eye, you want the eye to clean, clear and sharp. This particular fish is a silver shark, which has got a bacterial infection in its eyes. If you see this eventuating in any of your fish, make sure that your water quality is improved and add a antibacterial medication, and generally increase the amount of salt that's in the water. Make sure the fish are maintaining their position in the water very comfortably, which would be signifying that their swim bladder is intact. If the fish seems to be um, fighting to get to the bottom or doesn't look comfortable in the water column, you would definitely want to avoid that fish. Make sure when you're buying the fish that the fins, particularly the pectoral fins, are very clean and clear. Uh, various diseases, fungal, bacterial and parasitic diseases very much show up on the pectoral fin of the fish. Make sure that the pectoral fin is clean and clear and that the fish is waving the pectoral fin comfortably, not performing erratic movements with the pectoral fin. That will generally indicate irritation of a parasitic nature. When you see them shimmying in, in one spot or scratching against the rocks, that may indicate that they have contracted a parasitic infection which will spread and develop by far the most common problem that you'll experience would be white spot. White spot is a disease which is always present in the fish, just like a common cold. Now this white spot is a pathogen which in the event of stress will proliferate in the aquarium. So the way the white spot works is when the fish becomes stressed, the immune system of the fish goes down, the white spot will actually grow on the fish, leave the fish, reduplicate by the hundreds of million on a hard surface, then come back looking for a new host. Now if it comes back and meets a host, which is well established in the aquarium and has a good immune system, the equilibrium within the fish will control this basically with no problems. On the other hand, if it met a new fish or a fish which was significantly stressed due to either bad water quality other fish in the aquarium bullying it or anything else that may stress that particular fish, 
it will make the immune system of the fish lower, therefore more likely to contract the white spot. These parasites are very easy to identify. The fish will tend to breathe heavier. The fish will tend to be less active and look less comfortable in the water. It will flick and it will often just swim on the spot looking quite anxious or irritated. An easy physical way of seeing whether the fish have got white spot is during the, the more secondary phases of the infection, you'll easily see on the pectoral fin of the fish some very small white dots forming onto the fin of the fish. Along the rest of the fins is easy to see, even on the eye of the fish. As soon as you see this, you need to treat it with an anti-parasitic medication. There's many different brands available on the market which are really quite effective. Providing you get the medication in there quickly and your water quality is relatively high, and you don't have any carbon filters which will suck this medication out of the water. Generally, it's quite easy to control and the earlier you get onto this disease, the easier it is to cure. It's really important to give it at least two weeks after you've totally cured the disease before you think about adding new fish to the aquarium because white spot is a contagious disease, the new fish are quite likely to contract the disease as well. So white spot is quite common. The key is to be able to identify if they do get it, so therefore you can treat it. Treat it as soon as possible with what you understand to be the most effective medication which is available to you. Increase the amount of salt, then monitor your fish. While you've got a good, healthy, happy tank of fish, you'll find that breeding becomes quite a common circumstance within your cichlid aquarium. The way to tell if your fish are breeding and who's breeding with who is quite simple. The male will try to secure a territory and act quite aggressively. He'll often dig away a little pit. Then you'll see the little shimmering that they do, like you're doing a little dance to lure the female. As the female swims off, he'll often swim off in front of it and try and dance in front of it again, trying to lure the female to breed. Then once the female shows some interest and they're doing their little dance together, the female will lay the egg, the male will fertilize the egg, and then the female will pick the eggs up in her mouth. All the different species have got slightly different rituals of how they do it. Some will fertilize the eggs once it's inside the mouth of the fish, and they will do what's called a T movement. A T movement means the male will protect the egg of the female while doing a little dance. Then they'll change into that T position. The female will pick up the egg and mouth the vent of the male as the male is secreting its semen, which will go straight into the mouth of the female and fertilize the egg. This is one of the reasons why some of the particularly male cichlids will have little small spots on the anal fin of the fish is because the female will try to pick up that egg thinking it's an egg attracting more time to that region of the male while he's excreting his semen and will increase the chances of the eggs inside the mouth being fertilized. So for one breeding female to have a mouthful, generally only about one of that mouthful of 30, 40 or even 50 babies will grow up to being an adult fish. That's similar ratios to what occurs in the wild. Most of them will get eaten and become a part of the food chain and some of them will grow up to become adult fish. It's really important to be quite observant to what fish the male is trying to attract. If you see the male doing his dance and forming his cave or whatever his particular rituals are, and he seems to be dancing up and trying to impress the wrong female, you must take note of that because then that will be what's called hybridization and it's very important that we condemn any babies that come out of the result of hybridization because within any one country, we've got limited species of cichlids available and the worst thing that we want is for someone to hybridize some of these species that we have, sell them off to their friend or to an aquarium shop, for that person to think he knows what that fish is, breed it with the right fish, then sell those babies off to someone else, 
it's basically just ruining the strains that are available within any one country. So we want to make sure the right male breeds with the right female. In a display tank such as this one, any babies which are bred, unless you're 100% sure the right male is bred with the right female, you will generally discard of any of the babies. It's important you don't give them away, you don't sell them, that basically you keep them within your possession, in your aquariums, or you do need to kill them.